Dr. Culber reminisces about the 10C planet. President Rillick gets ghosted by Primarch to Hall. And Book is making oil bath plants with a brain soldier. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Uh, Sirach and I are having an oil bath. Uh, was it Wednesday? I think it's next <laughs> Wednesday. I, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, today... <laughs> Today, we're doing a review of Star Trek Discovery, Season 5, Episode 9, the penultimate episode in the series. Episode is entitled, some would call it LaGrange Point, written by Sean Cochran and Ari Friedman, directed by what Jonathan Frakes. We have a very special yeah. guest today, everybody. Uh, her name is Ari Friedman. Hello, Ari. How are you today? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me. So good having you. Glad to have you. Great episode, too. Yes. Thank you. Let's just get into it then, shall we? So, first things first, what's your story? How'd you get into this? How'd you get into working on Star Trek Discovery? And how did you get into writing this episode? Yeah, so um, I'm actually a comedy writer. I don't know if you could tell from this episode. <laughs> it's a little more comedy than normal. Uh, me and Sean both have comedy in us. Um, so it was a bit of a surprise to find myself working for Michelle Paradise, uh, end of season three, but I was really game and excited to hop aboard such an amazing franchise. Um, so I started as Michelle's assistant, the showrunner of the show. And, um, I kind of rose the ranks through up until season five. Um, and, before I started writing the episode, I was the writer's assistant. And then there was um, a freelance episode. Michelle is great with support staff. So she really, she um, promoted two previous support staff to staff writer um, before me and gives us every season a lot of opportunities to be more involved than just your typical support staff. Um, so there was an open episode, an open slot, and I... Um, submitted a script and was chosen to to write co-write the episode with Sean Cochran. Wow. So that's how I found myself writing this episode. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, is this the, the episode, the script that you submitted, is this the episode or is this, that was just like a, a spec script for just showing, showcasing your, your talent? It was a spec script. Um, anyone who wanted was able to submit. So, um, yeah, we, we just submitted spec scripts. Wow. Yeah. So everybody at home that might not know what that is, that's just like uh, a writer is, they write a, a theoretical script to an episode. Like, like, for example, I could write a spec script for Deep Space Nine. It would be terrible, but I know the characters enough to where I could be like, okay, it opens on Odo and Quark harumphing at each other and then red alert, you know, or whatever, you know, you get it. So she did that and it was very good. And they said, you know what? You should write and or co-write episode 509. By the way, Michelle Paradise seems pretty funny herself. You guys have a lot of banter between each other? She's so funny. Oh my God. She's, she just would always come to the room with, yeah, she's hilarious. Um, <laughs> there are a bunch of really funny people in this room actually, which is, you know, it's probably surprising, but it was actually like a fun, <laughs> funny room. Um, we were all, we're all like family at this point. Cause a lot of people stayed throughout a lot of seasons. Um, a bunch of them are coming to my house later tonight for a watch party. So that'll wow, be fun. Cool. Um, kudos to Michelle paradise. We've heard a lot of good things about her and her mm -hmm. leadership skills. I think that, um, you know, giving opportunities to people is a great thing. And when you see that, you know, there's advancement and opportunities for moving up. That's just great that she's able to see that in people. And clearly you delivered on your end because I think this episode really hits a lot of notes that I like about this show, which is the love story between book and burden. Um, yeah. And, and I thought that you really wrote the scene well, and was also performed well. Um, where Burnham comes out and kind of opens up the book about what, she's seen inside of the um the maze or the mindscape you know i, I enjoyed yeah. that scene a lot 
Yeah. Yeah. We um, wanted to make sure that I was looking back at my notes and we were calling it their heatness <laughs> that was portrayed <laughs> um, and moved forward, you know, because, uh, okay. I can't talk about five ten, but um, yeah, we wanted to make sure that it's it was just us. Uh... <laughs> yeah. No, no, right. not yet. Not exactly yet. What no happened. spoiler. Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I wanted, we wanted to make sure that there was a moment for them to really air things out. Yeah. Burnham had learned, had realized a lot in 508. It had, the subconscious had really become conscious for her. And um, we were like, let's try and figure out a space where they can whilst heisting uh, talk about their feelings and um, just like air things out. So I think they did a really good job as well. Yeah, you know, I was actually wondering about that. Like if you had mapped out, okay, in 508, Burnham has to have the realization. That means in 509, she has to reveal it to book, you know, if it was already kind of preordained or if, you know, once you're getting to 509, you're thinking, you know what, we should really hit it home here. I feel like it's a natural place for, you know, for her and book to kind of reconnect there because presumably 510, yeah. It, it's it's when everything that the series i mean but back then it was just the season it closes out so we're assuming those arcs were already meant to be closed can you talk a little bit about the when you start a season how you start uh mapping out the relationships how you start mapping out the character arcs for the season how does that work yeah um sorry one second let me just uh can you cut this out for some? No problem. <laughs> Just someone ringing the door right in the middle. Um, yeah, okay. So mapping out the season, it's different on every show. Um, and I've worked the longest with Michelle, but in her rooms, you know, she's so thorough and she's so character heart first, which I love. Um and we, from day one, were mapping out everyone, every character, including everyone on the bridge, um, everyone's uh, character arcs. And yeah, we have it beaten out generally for every episode um, pretty early on. So we didn't necessarily know exactly what Book and Burnham were going to say to each other in 509, or even if they would have this specific moment, but we knew generally where it was going um, pretty early on in the season. And um, the other thing too, is that at the beginning of this, every season, Michelle would, uh, um, she would give every writer and also support staff a character to kind of like, have as their baby to make sure that they're being seen and taken care of in every episode and um, to kind of make sure that their arc is like not being lost throughout the season. Yeah. I want to ask you the legendary Jonathan Frakes, who's like probably, you know, the one, one of the greatest directors of Star Trek ever um, is directing this episode. And you did mention being on the set. I wanted to ask you, what that was like seeing your work actually on the set because not not that many writers are actually mm -hmm. present while the filming is happening can you talk a little bit about his, him as a director and what you were experiencing on the set yeah so first of all i feel so so lucky that i was able to go up michelle really graciously let me let me go up um and watch the episode get made and then frakes was a doll from moment one uh just like pulled me in and was like what do you think about this what do you think about that um raven metzner who is one of the higher level writers on our show was also there so it was it was my first time on a set as a writer and a, a, as a writer of of an ep of the episode that i was watching so raven was like such an amazing mentor and between him and jonathan um it was such a special experience oh my god I, I've been on a few different sets before for TV and film and um, his style is so just like magnetic and charming and high energy and he's just 
you know, nothing phases him really. He's just like, let's, let's do this. He's just such a seasoned pro. Um, so it was, I was so excited when he was assigned to the episode. I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I was like, let's go. Um, yeah. And he was just amazing. Yeah. And he has no ego either. I mean, he was truly like, Ari, what do you think about this and that? And, um, yeah, it was just great. It was amazing. So here's a question for you, because we're going to talk about Jonathan Frakes a lot more in our <laughs> in our other segment later as well, because we love that dude. But yeah. um, this was the 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 second to last episode of the season. You didn't know at the time that this was going to be the end of the show, but you did know it was going to be the end of the season, which means you're not going to see each other for a while. Or, you know, maybe there's going to be some staff changes or maybe there was a little uncertainty where you never know. You think you're going to be renewed, but you never know for sure. Uh, can you tell us what the mood is like when you're filming 509, when you're finishing out 509? Is it sad? Is it joyous? Are you getting senioritis? What is it? What's it feel like? Um, I think for Discovery, we were split. Uh, some people were like, we're not going to make it another season. Mm -hmm. And they were really kind of just had a feeling. And I was among the people who was like, no, we're going to have another season because, you know, I was Michelle's assistant for a couple of years and I was privy to those conversations where it was just like for so many years, discovery was just such a staple, you know, for CBS and Paramount Plus. So it kind of felt like, no, surely they'll give us a sixth and final season to wrap things up because this is, you know, just the end of this chapter. And, you know, um, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. So I think, you know, it was to it was out of our hands too. I mean, there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff and there's so many amazing other Trek shows now. So it makes sense looking back. Um, but one of the things too that we felt as a room was like, we actually we were like we'll figure out where to go from here but like this feels a bit like a final season when we were writing it it felt like um a lot of the characters were being realized fully realized and um they were hitting places that we felt like this feels like a solid ending so we weren't we we didn't feel and uh you know you'll have your thoughts after watching 510 but we didn't feel like oh, you know, it's a bummer that we weren't able to like close some things up. Um, like some shows are just canceled when they're in the middle of like a huge cliffhanger or whatever, you know, it just, um, we were able to wrap things up really nicely. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I I, I do think that- oh, sorry. Um, I, I didn't realize I muted myself. I was just gonna say, uh, Strzok, I know, <laughs> I know you got a lot more to ask, but I just wanted to, to jump on that because um yeah 509 it's it's a really good episode it's really fun and it's when i noticed like you were saying that it kind of does feel like some of these characters have arcs that are completing not that are just improving or changing and then there's gonna be more like i, I saw it mostly with saru and tarina i was almost like where yeah. did they go after this they're they they could close the door here. Adira is having growth. Uh, Culber and Stamets are having growth as found parents. You know, mm -hmm. it, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of that. And then and then Book and Burnham as they're coming back together it just felt like this could even, be even even Tilly and Ray and Rainer. yes, <laughs> right. Totally. They even had a, like a like a growth moment there. Mm hmm. Yes. And uh, and yeah. Reese, even Reese. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's it. I was saying even even Commander Reese. You know, he's. We enjoyed that. We're, that's yeah. why we're 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 kind of heaping praises on you because uh, we like to see a lot of the characters get their kind of moments, and I felt like this episode yeah. covered that. Like I, I, I got moments from people that uh, characters that are sometimes always not even recognized. They're just like, hey, I need more power, and you're like, okay. I just I'll give you more power, Captain. But there's not like any for further, you know, follow up on what they think or feel or, you know, and so I, I did feel like there was a lot of that in this episode. Yes, we wanted to take care of those characters, you know, I mean, um, 
I love those characters as well. And I think that it it adds ultimately it's Michelle's vision, you know, but I I definitely wanted there to be as much and Sean as well as many little moments like that as possible. And, you know, when we were thinking, okay, who would go on the mission? You know, we were, it was all on purpose. Yeah. We wanted them to have moments. Yeah. Adira stepped up big on that. Uh, I was like, whoa, Adira is going on the mission. This was kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me ask you, because you mentioned earlier about some stuff not making it in the episode and it felt like there could have been a lot of things that, maybe didn't get featured or could have made the cutting room floor. Um, is there some stuff that was like you you wanted more of or you wish was kind of left in it? Um, well, there were just different iterations of the heist. You know, there were um, a bunch of, we, we talked about that a lot. We were really, you know, it was giving Ocean's Eleven. We were really trying to, okay. <laughs> wanted to um, have as much fun as possible. So, but ultimately, you know, we, we're trying it's always the balance of like making the best writing the best episode for the budget you have and and in the bigger season and you know um but let me see I was looking at my notes okay well there was one there were a few different moments I mean there were literally a few lines that I was like god damn it but I get it why they took it out because me and Sean the draft we turned in (laughs) <laughs> had had a f- like a few more jokes per capita than what made it which like would have been too outside of discovery's sphere um for the season so it totally makes sense that it was like stripped down and i think it ended up perfect but you know we were poking fun at uh you know book being like in the suit like we could start a band with these call ourselves the metalheads didn't make it (laughs) (laughs) Ryan would have loved that yeah yeah Ryan does love that yeah (laughs) um and there were a bunch of things actually you know for the most part they're like the major you know strokes of the episode were kind of like what we came up with at the beginning of planning it so um discovery crashing in to the green ship you know that was that was supposed that was meant to be a big set piece um one thing that didn't make it in i think that i would have loved to see um but that they still flawlessly figured it out was we were like and then Burnham and Maul jump out and they're in space and it's slow motion and mm. you know like they're around the progenitor tech and it's all and then they're fighting each other and then they're climbing on top of each other and it opens and they get sucked in and that didn't make it <laughs> I could picture it I could definitely picture yeah. that picture. though yeah it feels very discovery like mm-hmm. it could have been it could have been a really fun moment um but yeah that's obviously uh more VFX than we could afford. Um, well, yeah. I, I was still tripping when I saw Burnham go inside of the thing. I was like, what are you doing? You are always I know. She's like too hey. far. Yeah, like what's taking wrong with too you? Far. <laughs> You're taking things always gotta go like to that next step. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, she kind of looks back like, you know, it's that like kind of hand in the cookie jar moment where it's like. I know I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, but see ya. Yeah. Um, loved how she played that too. Yeah. You know, in that moment, actually, we were talking, we talked about that moment a lot because that is also my favorite part of the series is like the connections that the characters have with each other. And we really wanted to make sure, even though we had that conversation with them earlier, um, it was meant to be like they kind of aired some stuff out kind of a walk and talk, which they ended up, you know, going into a corner and pausing, but, you know, they're walking and talking, airing some things out, don't fully finish what they're meant to say to each other. And then it's all summed up in that look when Burnham Mm -hmm. looks at book and, and, you know, that, and she's saying, I love you. I'm sorry. I wish this were different, you know, and she goes and he's like, yeah. Um, But ultimately he lets her go. He doesn't really have a choice, but yeah. I, I loved that moment so much. We talked about it a lot. We wanted to make sure that they had this like moment where words really weren't necessary. Well, Ari, um, yeah, I'm about to put you on the spot if that's okay. Um, 
Uh-oh. Do you have a favorite character to write for? Is there, you know, like sometimes you're just like, okay, I, I love writing for Rainer because I feel like he's the new guy or I love writing for, you know, book because he's like Han Solo or what do you, what do you have? Is there somebody you really enjoy? Yes. Tilly. <laughs> Tilly's my favorite. Yeah, because she's got the comedy thing. And you get to yeah, do the she's, <laughs> she's so like, she's, Mary's just like such an amazing actress. And, and yeah, just like um, coming up with how she's going to be and what she's going to do for the season felt really, yeah, it was just like always really exciting and um, feeling exactly like you said. I mean, um, it's the comedy for me. And I'm like, she's, she can break any tension in any scene, you know? But then also, like, one thing that I loved that I saw someone wrote about this episode was like, you know, Tilly sometimes is is bumbling and sputtering and, you know, it doesn't let her shine her full potential. But in this episode, she's bumbling and sputtering because her brain is going too fast because she's literally, like, computing on the spot. So she's not just all funny. She's also really smart. And, yeah. um, and like subtly helped Rainer sit in the chair at the end, you know, like gave him that little push, um, which is also a moment we were so excited for and was potentially not going to be at the end of 509. It was mm. going to be maybe 510. And we were like, please, <laughs> like, let us have it. Um, yeah. So long, long answer short, uh, Tilly. Tilly. Yeah, this nice. this episode, I, she had a moment there where um, uh, Rainer says to her, I, "I want you to be my number one," and she's like, she, she, "She's like, thank you very good." And she kind of holds it. It was such a good delivery. I thought, "Wow, this is so good." She knows how to like, like pull it back when she realizes, "Oh, I'm I'm doing too much right now," in character. You know what I mean? So it's so good as a performer yeah. to watch her. Right. And who wrote play, Schnoodle? Play, play those awkward beats. Who wrote, who <laughs> yes, wrote Schnoodle? Schnoodle? Holy Schnoodle. Yeah, I wrote that yeah. down in my notes. <laughs> oh, um, I think that might have been Michelle. That's a Michelle special. Um, well, <laughs> my version was holy shit. It was true. Okay. <laughs> it was first it was holy shit, then it was holy sh and then Rainer Barrels in. Um, and then it was holy schnoodle. I gotta say, I thought that was my favorite <laughs> moment. <laughs> because of the actors the two actors there really made like this was the first time i saw rainer feeling confident and comfortable uh since the first episode when he did this move and he goes that's the plan he does the point that's the plan i was like that's good that was a good choice it's well written well executed he says that's the plan and then Mary says, holy, you know, schnoodle, whatever. I was like, that is a great double moment there. Uh, yeah. Well executed. The actors were amazing. Well written. So uh, good stuff there. Um, however. Yeah, yes. I also love uh, Rainer. Yeah, I was just going to point out Rainer. But what were you saying, Ciroc? Uh I was going to say one of my favorite lines. I think Stamets also delivered the way he said math doesn't lie. Mm-hmm. I thought was like um, one of his like classic moments, almost like a t-shirt for Stamets moment. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Someone needs to make that merch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. The way he says it's like, like math doesn't lie. It was wonderful. Um, I want to tell I want to coin uh, a word and I want you to be here when I do it. Um, Ari, this is, this is for this episode. Okay, great. When I, when I saw Saru step up in that moment and offer to basically kill himself, essentially, it looked like a, like a bad mission. Uh, I said, "This is a suicide mission," and I don't know if you if you dropped that in the in the <laughs> in the writers' yeah. room, but I was like, yes. "What the hell's going on here? This is a suicide mission," and yes, it almost right. yes. No, I was just going to say that um, that was actually the title of the episode, but Michelle changed it at the last minute. No. Holy shit. No way. <laughs> no, no. It, was, it was a tough uh, choice. I thought it was going to be the uh, Kobayashi Saru was what I thought it was going to be. For, uh, I, I, I thought it was a great moment there. And almost it, it was payoff from an earlier moment that we had with Saru 
And that was when he was kind of butting into her business a little bit. And she kind of checked him and was like, yo, I make my own decisions and, you know, I don't need your to step in the way and be meddling. And I felt yeah. like this was like payoff for that moment too, because now Saru is like saying that back almost in a way like, you know, uh, that's my ship. These are my guys and I'm going to do this no matter what you say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's exactly what we were going for. And, um, but also their union at the end of the episode, I felt was really nice because there were a few different ways we were thinking of playing it. Um, we had Saru making that decision because we always felt like, okay, Saru's going to need to, we also just, you know, we needed him to be there. Um, but we wanted him to make that choice and we wanted that call back from the beginning. And we were like, would Tarina be like really upset and try to stop him from going? But Michelle ultimately like finessed it. So she, so it was kind of a, a reveal when she was like, no, no, no. I, I knew that you, uh, what was it that you, you had to go and I never want you to make choices on like just the callback of like, I never want you to make choices on my behalf, which is like, which is actually, yeah. it, it works really well in the story, but it's funny given like, in in actual present day right now in reality it's just funny the someone being like no i i choose work over our relationship <laughs> <laughs> and and the audience going exactly um yeah, but yeah. for the show <laughs> well it works because he has a connection with everybody on board and yeah. He's thinking yeah. about the lives of everybody on that ship. Um, mm -hmm. So he's being really selfless in that moment. You know, he's actually putting other people in front of himself, but, which is what I kind of would think Saru would always be doing in general. Yeah. Yeah. They're both, they're, they're all really selfless. And um, yeah, it's just like the most important work in the galaxy. So he had to do what he had to do. Trina's blessing. Barely, yeah. barely her blessing, <laughs> but she did. She she understood. She she kind of scolded him in a Vulcan way, you know. But she was also very sweet in a Vulcan way when she said, yeah. "It would be illogical to ask you to promise to return. So instead, I'll just ask that you try." Yeah, it's a beautiful line. That's Michelle as well. That line is is perfect, and also the actress. Um, God. Tara Rosling. She's amazing. Yes. We love her. She's amazing. She can just convey so much with a single look. So we knew she'd she'd kill it. She's magic. I also love the villain in this season. Uh, the, the girl playing Maul, I think, yeah. is fantastic as well. She's just a great villain, you know? Um, and kind of like not even that much of a villain where you want her like where you want her killed you just want her to just shake some sense into her like yeah you're on the wrong yeah. side yes <laughs> like, yes just i get you me. i get it yeah like i get it i get what you're going to be you're, <laughs> you're like it's, it's like you're gonna destroy the world <laughs> these guys yeah. that you're with the breed are not like good people like stop trying to so sign up with them they're not gonna help you out maybe the one that you found you know but you found one good guy out of like I don't know how big the brain are, but I, I feel like <laughs> yeah. after Dozens. we saw that, after we saw, after we saw that vision of the future, we're like, you know, come on, just have some sense. But yeah, they're all good. Uh, you see seeing them. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're just gooey anyway. Well, Ari, yeah. we only have you for a couple more minutes here. Uh, but before we go, uh, first of all. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Yeah. This has been really cool. Um, yeah. But also, now that we know that Discovery is over, can you please, you know, give us a little reflection on the time that you spent with Discovery, the things that you loved, the things that maybe you won't miss. Maybe the maybe you guys had some late nights. Uh, give us a little bit of introspection about, about Discovery and and how much you think we're going to love next week's final episode. Oh, man. Some of the best years of my life. Seriously. Um, I will very much miss and have missed, because, you know, we finished in late 2022, 
um, working with the writers of each season. Um, many of them say the same. Some of them were there for a season or two. Um, we just had a really great dynamic. Uh, I think, you know, I was also able to see once the writers left working with Michelle, she just, it's crazy. She's running so many different things. She's running the room. She's running pre-production, production, post-production post all at the same time, sometimes seasons overlapping. Maybe that's what I won't miss is that there was never not something going on. Um, but at the same time, it's, it was what made it really fun and exciting. Um, and in terms of next week, oh my God, it's such an incredible episode. I'm excited for you guys. Um, and it's a great farewell and, um, yeah, I have no doubt that people will really like it. Really, oh. really like it. Yeah. I can I can feel some tears coming on already. <laughs> uh, yeah. I haven't even seen it, but I just can anticipate it based on what I feel everything going. Um but yeah, I mean it's 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 been a great ride though, you know, watching you guys take this show and be the flagship for Paramount Plus and you know, really guide them in the journey onto the online platform so that job was actually uh, successful <laughs> yeah well ari yeah. It's a success we did it and uh we do really appreciate you taking the time for us thank you so yeah. much for hanging out with us uh absolutely lots of fun yep. and we will uh follow your career with great interest i think that's a star wars quote whatever <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, well, one thing I used to, one thing I will say is I used to always be like, uh, I would, I would just be like, may the force be with you. And people would be horrified. <laughs> I would they need to relax. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> Star Wars is also fun. <laughs> yeah. You have to do this when you say it though. Yeah. That's what I would say. I mean, I would say to people like, yeah, I work on Star Trek. May the force be with you. <laughs> nanu, like, nanu. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, everybody, everybody stick around. Uh, we will be right back with a lot more to talk about on this episode on The Seventh Rule. Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello. Here are the trivioids of the week. You are going to love them. Saru brings Tarina flowers from Elpana. Elpana. I don't know. The five remaining Primarchs smell blood in the water. Dr. Culber reminisces about the 10C planet. Shout out to Dr. Muhammad Noor for his help with the 10C. Commander yeah. Rayner avoids the captain's chair like the plague. President Rillac's first name is Lara. President Rillac gets ghosted by Primarch to Hall. And Book is making oil bath plans with a Breen soldier. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oil bath, Sark mates. Yeah, that's right. Sark mates. That was fun. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think it's fun that there are five Primarchs left. And they are now basically, it's like Game of Thrones. You know, it's like the 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 king is dead, and now the, the five princes or smaller kings are like, all right. <laughs> who's the, who's the new one in charge? And apparently. Primark to Hall is the front runner. And it's really cool. I'm having a lot of fun watching the Breen. A lot of times I can be kind of grumpy and be like, this alien race doesn't do that. I remember in Next Generation, you know, whatever. I get into those kind of fussy, duddy things, but I really like how they are expanding the Breen. I'm very happy with it. What do you what do you think? I'll tell you what. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more. Uh, I guess I was expecting something that I didn't get when it comes to the Breen. And this is what it was. I was expecting the Breen to honor their marriage or love for each other in such a way that they would basically 
make her like some kind of empress, you know, of their of their situation. So it's still like there's a power struggle there where, you know, she's not in charge, but she's kind of in charge. And it's weird for me because I I would have liked that to have been explained away in a in a way that gave her more dominion over that role. So she has this kind of I've got the brain under my control. It seems like she's slightly not in control slash in control. And that's where it's it's a gray area for me to kind of like fully identify. I I would have liked if Locke and Maul had of done some kind of green ritual ceremony of union that is honored on the degree of marriage that made her eligible to be the heir of the Breen Empire. And I, I would have liked that to have transpired to, to give an air of legitimacy to her reign over the Breen. And I, that would have made a little bit more sense for me. Yeah, uh, because they do talk about it. They discuss it a little bit, but we never saw that happen. So we don't have that kind of backstory. That It's almost like emotional backstory where we get to follow in their emotional arc uh, and for all we know right now, there's writers going, we wrote that in, but it got cut out. It was in episode three, bro. You know, I guess they did kind of, I mean, it showed some of the love story and flashbacks actually, but yeah, we showed never the got love to story, but, it, but we they don't see show that, that there's a union, like there's an Good actual point. marriage, like they're mm -hmm. married, you know, like a ring on the finger or a tribal tattoo or some, some, some ceremony, ceremony. They did, they did have a tattoo together. Yeah. Kind of yeah. or something. What was it? I don't remember. Uh, I would have liked that to be the justification, like, you know, she's the wife of our guy. And therefore, you know, she gets a chance to be on the throne until she mm -hmm. proves otherwise. Some kind mm -hmm. of, you know, 30 day, well, 30 day or your money back guarantee, you know, green guarantee for her to be in charge because the, the vacuum of the, the fighting amongst them is good, but I, it seems like she's calling the shots, right? Like, like mm -hmm. at the end, she's like, shut shit down, shut it down. Uh, you know, I want everybody's identification. So she's like calling shots like she's Darth Vader or something. But nice. At, but in the ep a couple of episodes before, it was like she was getting, you know, kind of bullied by mm -hmm. the other head brain who was around. So I'm just saying I would have liked that to have been clarified a little bit more and the respect given to her because she's almost taking that respect. So it might as well have been forfeited to her. Mm -hmm. I like that 30 day guarantee idea. If you don't like your lock, go ahead and bring him back to the store <laughs> for a, a refund. Uh, but here, here's... Yeah, because I'm loving the Breen stuff. And it, I, I'm happy if, if they want to show us more Breen, more Locke and Maul, yeah. I'm happy with it. Um, yeah. So here's here's something. It opens. The episode opens. First thing. Shh. Right? Camera's twisting on a Ferengi talking to some other guy. And my first thought was, whoa, who's directing this? And then it says, Jonathan Frakes. I'm like, I should have guessed that. I should, because yeah. he does like to do, he also likes to do the camera that goes, you know, we're like, we're watching them walk upside down and then they walk and then we yeah. follow them. Like he does fun. He has way too much fun. He had, it's supposed to be work, but he's out there <laughs> having too much fun and I'm loving it. Uh, you love yourself a little Frakes, right? Yeah, no, I love, I love Frakes. I think he's, you know, he, his his reign has covered so much Star Trek that it's you know undeniable that he is you know on the Mount Rushmore of Star Trek directors. Um, like I said, covering so many different series, so many different episodes, so many different actors that he's worked alongside, and you know he's given us a lot of memorable moments. So I think yeah, you have to give him his flowers and say that he is uh one of if not the uh most prolific star trek director um of our time uh, also including the, the the motion picture that he directed so i mean yeah you have first to basically... contact and uh generations 
Yeah, so he's 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 just you know the gold standard, and it doesn't matter whether it's a feature film or or what series it is. He always brings uh, element of um, playfulness, uh, of inclusion. You know, we just talked with uh, Ari Friedman about her experience on the set and how he made her feel you know, uh, included and kind of, you know, brought her in. I think there's a, that's what he does. And that's what you feel when you're around him. There's this energy of inclusion and a bigness to his personality that is infectious and kind of makes you smile and makes you passionate because he uh, exudes a certain passion for the work that he does. So yeah, once it, once I saw it, it was a Jonathan Frakes episode, I already kind of like you know, yeah. pour, I poured a bowl, bowl of popcorn and said, let me see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. You know, you said something uh, among many interesting things, one sp in specific, which was the Mount Rushmore of directors of Star Trek. My question to all the fans out there, who is your Star Trek director's Mount Rushmore? And I could hear about 60 Star Trek fans all groaning at that question, like, oh, it's too hard. Don't ask me that. You know, there are people like David Livingston. I think Olatunde, what's his last name? Osun Sanmi, something like that. I feel like he's quickly making a case for himself in the Mount Rushmore. He's all over the place in Strange New Worlds and Discovery, or Discovery and maybe Picard too. I don't know. I feel like he's he's everywhere. He's done a whole bunch. Anyway, so everybody in the comments below, who is your Mount Rushmore of directors? That's four directors, everybody, the four horsemen, horse people. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so um, two black holes. Commander Jemison, did you catch that? We had a new character in, uh, we had a new character flying the ship. Yeah, who was that? Just a new character, new new actress who uh, is first coming on for this episode. Her name is Commander Jemison. Obviously May named Jemison. after. Yes. I thought that was, I was like, Discovery knows we're not going to miss that. Discovery knows we're going to yeah. catch it, but pretty cool. I love that. Good, uh, good homage. A Stanford alumni, I might add. Really? Yeah. Like you, kind of. Yeah, right. <laughs> Teaching there. Adjacent. Adjacent. Uh, I'm, I'm Stanford adjacent, but certainly, uh, yeah, I saw that. But I also wanted to ask you about, there was a, was it a Gallo? Is that the alien that I saw that had the weird, like? Mm, yeah, so what, Gallo, what is is alien? A, Gallo is a new character, Lieutenant Gallo, this season. She's, you know, she's also in the front of the the bridge, rather, whether I like at the con or something like that. Uh, she kind of have the, the dark, short, kind of mid-length hair. The alien that you saw shaking around, not Linus, right? Not the sorry, not Linus, the other, the other one with just all kinds of messy. Yeah, that is yeah. an Osnalis. Osnalis. Um, I think that was played by Ava Blackwell. Is that from is that Australia? Right? <laughs> No, I, was, uh, I think I it's nervous. I think it's Ava Blackwell who plays her. Let me let me check and make sure because sometimes I get that makeup wrong. job is ridiculous. I wish it was not, it got more of a close up in there. I was like, hey, Jonathan Frakes, give me yeah. some close ups. It is Ava Blackwell. She's also she also has done stunts in a bunch of episodes of Strange New Worlds. So she is multi talented, kind of like a female version of Saru. Um, she's also played Lieutenant Ina. So we have seen her face and uh, Captain Rama. Can't remember what that was, but that was an alien. Anyway, so she, that's an Osnalis. Here's an interesting fact. I believe this is f a fact. That alien race, that mask, that makeup was what Doug Jones's Saru was originally going to look like. No. But they ended yeah, up going I... with this other look. And so now they still use that, I guess, as, and called it the Osnalis. Anyway. Hmm. Pretty cool. Um, also, awesome. here's something I'd like to point out. You know our good friend Andre Kotman. Andre Kotman, we used to do the uh, Discovery viewing parties together at his place out in Glendale. Well, check this yeah. out. Let me see if I can pull this up. Oh, man, that's not going to work. Well, it's going to take a second then. 
So here it is. They pull up a, a star chart in the episode, and Andre Kotman caught, caught this. And he says, what's going on here? And Doria is back in Starfleet. <clears throat> Orion looks like it's now a member of the Federation. Is this correct? Like, are do the stars tell us the planets that are part of the Federation? Because if so, I think Andoria was not part of the Federation for a while there, and now it is. And Orion was never part of the Federation, but of course we did see that one Orion uh, character last season that was one of the cadets that Tilly was teaching. So anyway, so that's kind of an interesting, great catch by Andre Kotman. Wow. <clears throat> you got to freeze frame that to find that. I, <laughs> you really got to zoom in on that. That was a great catch, Andre. Yeah. Yeah. As soon yeah, as they show stars... As soon as they show stars, you know Andre is going to pause that shit and zoom in. <laughs> <laughs> he will every time. Yeah, no, I, that uh, I missed that, but mm -hmm. I did also like. I saw the the moment there. I thought was a cool little bit of technology. I, I always like the little miniature technology moments, but um, when Maul basically puts Locke inside of that bracelet link or whatever that is uh i'm like how does that work you know what i mean uh, I, I called that one lock in the box but you know that's <laughs> i wondered how she did that I, you know what, what was the technology behind that because it kind of like folded him up and put him inside of this little locket mm -hmm. it was just a small lock right <laughs> anyway so look, the point is here, we only got a couple minutes left, but uh, we had a non-appearance mention for Admiral Vance. Uh, we had a non-appearance mention kind of for Locke. <laughs> poor guy, he's going to keep getting non-appearance yeah. mentions, poor guy, unless he gets yeah. revived in the final episode. Who knows? Hopefully, shout out to our good friend Elias Tufexis. So before we yeah. go, though, I guess the home run of the day, Ciroc. Hmm. Home run of this episode. Hmm. Yeah, you know, um, I, I want to say I did like Rainer a lot in this episode. I thought he gave a very, he's starting to become likable. Um, you know, he's just crossing the threshold over from dislike to like which I like about it because he's putting the effort to want to be liked or to try to get along. And that's all you have to really do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one positive takeaway. I really liked his performance and forgive me if I don't know the actor who plays commander Rainer, but he did, he's doing a great job. Callum Keith uh, Rennie, I believe. Okay. Yeah. He's doing a great job. I mm -hmm. really liked him in this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm going to give the home run to Jonathan Frakes. Hey! House. <laughs> nice. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, I should have taken this time while you were doing that to think of mine. But instead, I was just kind of like listening to you. <laughs> like you were telling a story. I was like, this is nice. I just like listening to him talk sometimes. It's nice. Um, home run of the episode for me... Oh, hmm. it's got to be both uh, Doug Jones and Tara Rosling because those two can act the out of this show. I mean, my God, I, when Doug said, uh, what, what was the line that he said? Uh, 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 sorry, let me find it really quickly. Okay, I don't think I wrote it down, but he said, when she said it would be illogical to ask you to promise to return, so instead I'll just ask that you try. And he basically said, you know, I will see you again when I return. And just that little inflection on when. And I was like, only Doug Jones can say that in such a thoughtful and tender way. Like this single syllable. And it just works. It says everything. Um, you know, maybe it was it was italicized in the script. Who knows? 
but Doug knocked it out of the park. He's amazing. Yeah. And Tara Rosling is amazing in the way she can convey so much through a stoic face, kind of like Data, kind of like Brent Spiner. Beautiful. She is a beautiful, beautiful actress. So I say those two. Um, all right. Yeah. But here are some other people that are no strangers to home runs themselves. A couple of them triples. Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ, Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Titus Muller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, ground rule double, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz. My life from Tokyo has been known to hit an infield home run. It's really weird. Inside the park home run that stayed in the infield. Uh, the <laughs> Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, uh, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfi, Greg K. Wickstrom out in Hawaii, doesn't even know what baseball is, probably. Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, Chris Sternett, Chuck A., Joanna Yunker, Amiram Mizne, Nora Vega, Ed Jarrett, Steve Case, and of course, Jason M. Oaken, who hates when we talk about sports. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. It's been a great time. We cannot wait for this final episode. I can't believe it's the final episode. But Yeah, I can't believe it either. It's here. Uh, it, it doesn't feel like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's getting sad. Mm -hmm. It is. Especially because they put in so much of their heart and soul into this. A really good group of people. All right. Yeah. Thank you all very much for hanging out with us, everybody. Let us know in the comments below your Mount Rushmore of Star Trek directors, and we will see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule.